Caroline Dowd Higgins. Thank you for listening to Your Working Life, my podcast series featuring luminaries in the career, leadership, financial, entrepreneurial, and wellness fields. I know you spend a significant portion of your life at work, so I'm on a mission to help provide you with tools and inspiration and resources so you can enjoy your career and love your life. And I'm so excited to have my special guest, David Howitt, with me today. David, welcome. So glad you're with me. Thanks, Carolyn. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're so welcome. So I want to tell our listeners about you. You are the founder and CEO of the Merriweather Group, and you're an inspiring thought leader and an accomplished entrepreneur with more than 20 years of experience providing financial, strategic, and brand counsel to early stage and Fortune 100 companies. And David, you have this unique ability to integrate vision and growth strategies with mission and purpose, and you've provided guidance. Guidance to Oregon Chai, Stumptown Coffee, Pendleton, Adidas, Voodoo Donut, one of my favorites. <laughs> uh, lots of incredible brands, right? ABC Carpet and Home, Living Harvest, and many others. But today, we're going to focus on your wonderful new book, Heed Your Call. So, David, tell me the story. How did this book come to pass? Well, firstly, Carolyn, thanks so much for that introduction. That was really kind. Um, so the book really is a culmination, frankly, of my life. Um, you know, I would say that there's a real strong part of the book that's a narrative of really uh, my path, my journey. And it also incorporates the businesses and companies that I've been fortunate enough to advise and invest in um, and work with, one of those being Oregon Chai, a company that my wife and I started and really why the book, I guess, is I came to a place in my life where I felt like there was a lot of great books in the market on business and a lot of great books in the market on how to live a life of purpose and meaning. But I had not come across a work that created a bridge between the two. And if there's anything that my life has really been about, I would say it's that. So I felt like it was time for there to be a work that allowed the reader to have one foot sort of firmly in the world of commerce and abundance and earning and one foot in the camp of meaning and purpose and spirit and, and authenticity and show them some real tools and constructs as to how to create a bridge between the two. Beautifully done. And, you know, I think that's so important because it's not one or the other. There's an integrated approach, and that's what's so great about the book. I want to make sure I honor the full title. So Heed Your Call, Integrating Myth, Science, Spirituality, and Business. And it's been called this modern-day manifesto. And one of the things that you speak so eloquently about in the book is innovators whose creativity has been stilted. Now, you're an innovator. Ha have you ever experienced that, uh, that dry spell? Absolutely. And I think probably most of your listeners have. You know, unfortunately, our world, in my estimation, has really um, put this concept of what I refer to in the book as the tyranny of ore mm. into our lives. That, you know, you have to choose, that we have this sort of Hobbesian choice. And it's thrust upon us really at the earliest age where, you know, you either you either are a person who are who is artistic and creative and has purpose and meaning. Um, and you really have a lot of fulfilling sort of empathetic, uh, and deep connections and you use your intuition, but you're, but you're broke mm -hmm. or the world tells us you're an executive and you're really great with numbers and facts and figures and leadership and profit. Uh, but you probably have weak relationships, lots of money, but very little intuition, empathy, meaning, or purpose. And so my, you know, in my estimation, that's a lie and that's not what the future requires from us individually or from our enterprises. So to answer your question, absolutely. There have been times in my life where, you know, I have been in leadership roles and positions, but I've been in a culture or part of a, a business where you weren't allowed or given permission to be a leader and also be a poet, yeah. to be, yeah. you know, artistic and analytical. And those are very, very difficult and challenging situations to sort of work through. You know what I find so interesting, the way you address the dichotomy of how people handle money, right? Some, as you just mentioned, some people are really great with money and others aren't. And in the, in the business slash professional world, we've, we've got to dance that delicate dance. So what are, what's a lesson that you've learned about money? 
So, you know, to me, um, Carolyn, money is really energy. And when we approach it from the perspective of it isn't a means in and of itself, but it's simply an energetic kind of component of our lives. And when we focus on following our bliss, our path, you know, the Buddhists would say our dharma, right? The, the things that make us feel alive and come alive, my experience is the money follows you. Mm. When you chase the money, you'll find yourself, in my experience, working really hard, exhausted, taxed, uh, feeling really beaten up. And you may achieve some financial success, but at what cost? And so what, what I've tried to do in Heed Your Call is share with the reader that, you know, in actuality, we can have situations that are easy, that are fulfilling, that produce results and make a lot of money. Um, and that this sort of archaic Protestant work ethic that's beaten into a lot of our heads right. says, you know, put your shoulder against the plow and work long and toil and the more exhausted suffer, you are, right. you suffer, yeah, that somehow that connotes or equates to success. And, you know, the reality is I've looked at Oregon Chai, our business and dozens of others that are outlined in the book. And the reality is these entrepreneurs, these businesses have produced significant wealth, significant abundance for the owners the employees and the community. And frankly, they've been a lot of fun. Yeah, which is great, which is great. Life life is too short, right? I, I mean, my right. tagline is enjoy your career and love your life. So I, I applaud you. Thanks, Carolyn. And you know, your point, which I love that, is there really isn't, as I say in the book, this concept of life-work balance. There's just life. I agree. You know, yeah. and and, you know, you know, a lot of people talk about their yoga or their yoga practice. I mean, as you know, the word yoga in Sanskrit just means union. Right. And so um, we need to unionize to integrate our lives. So it's not, well, I go to, you know, church or synagogue or ashram or yoga and I compartmentalize that over here. And then I have my personal life and my family life and that sits over here. And then I have my work life and that sits over here. I mean, that creates this sort of schizophrenic existence mm -hmm. where we have this ability to actually weave and integrate them all together into one. And from there, we just live what I call authentic lives. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. I think that's exciting. So it really is this this shift in consciousness, right? That it's not one or the other, that there isn't a balance, which makes me think of this, you know, teeter-totter graphic. It's it's never perfectly balanced, but it's fully integrated and we strive for authenticity. Absolutely true. So I'm, I'm intrigued by these 11 real world lessons that you so beautifully illustrated. Tell me about how those came to you. Were these personal life experiences? T tell us, tell us what that's all about. Yeah. So, you know, the book really is a deeply personal narrative and, you know, I've had a few readers and people say, wow, you really put yourself out there. Um, you know, that's pretty daring. I guess I just didn't know any other way to do it. Mm -hmm. I, really felt like for me as a person who does have a spiritual practice, but also is a, you know, absolutely someone who lives in the world and has a, you know, a career and, and, you know, all the things that come with real world existence. Mm -hmm. I wanted a book that shared actual real life stories, narratives, and examples that wasn't just theoretical, you know, didn't have a lot of kind of woo-woo, or if yeah. it did have woo-woo, it was actually tied back to something demonstrative. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, you know, I've shared, you know, my actual life experiences from growing up in a, you know, relatively conservative Midwestern home to a family of kind of culturally Jewish parents, um, divorce, the challenges in my life. Um, I've shared pretty openly and honestly, and the idea is that all of us have our own version of our childhood, our known world. Right. And I wanted the reader to be able to connect with that and to understand that, you know, that they, each one of us, has this unique opportunity to live this kind of heroic journey and to step out of our comfort zone, out of our known world, and to start down a path that maybe is a bit more aligned with our soul's intention and purpose and that when we do that, not only do we create a more abundant and happy life for ourselves, but we actually play a really important role in healing the world.
Brilliant. I love it. So you you are very self-actualized. Were you always this way or did it take time in your life to get to this point? Uh, well, I appreciate the self-actualized comment. I mean, honestly, I feel like I'm still very much a work in progress. Um, you know, I'm climbing the same mountain that we all are. I'm on the path. Some days I stumble off. Some days I'm able to get right back on. Some days it takes a little longer. But what I have had is, you know, a very rich and blessed life of a lot of amazing mentors and guides, a lot of very difficult shadow and conflict. And the culmination of that has been, you know, I feel um, reaching a place in my life where I actually have something, hopefully, to share. And that these insights, these constructs, um, these experiences can be useful. Uh, you know, my life has absolutely had challenges. I mean, I grew up believing that I had to be a lawyer or a doctor or an executive. And, you know, from that place, I did what most of us do. I buckled down and just did it and ultimately came out of law school and achieved a great job and a big prestigious law firm only to find that I was just miserable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, waking up one day in your kind of mid twenties and realizing that, you know, your entire life and tens of thousands of dollars in education and decades of years have been in service to something that was uniquely not aligned with who I was is pretty depressing, you know, and then to try to muster up the courage to actually do something about it was darn near, you know, uh, you know, horrible mm -hmm. and incredibly um, challenging on like a soul level. Um, but what I'll promise the listener and the reader is when you do it and when you allow yourself the space to actually start living from your own place of purpose, it's really amazing how the universe will come in to support you. Well, and David, I have to say too, as, as a reader, right, someone who's enjoyed the book, your ability to share with, with humility and grace and frankly, fearlessness to say, look, this was tough, right? It's very relatable and very human. And I think we can all relate on some level, whatever our individual path has been. And you're, you're a hero because you show us, look, this can be done. And again, with a beautiful authenticity and, and simplicity, and I mean that in a, in a very complimentary way. Okay. So let me ask though, I want to pick because as a career development person, I, I firmly believe in your concept of following your passion and honoring your inner voice. And, and I know it, it takes some time to figure out what that is. So what is your wisdom for our listeners about how to get quiet with themselves and figure out what that inner voice is saying? Yep, absolutely. You know, most of us are really afraid of that inner voice, which is sort of ultimately ironic because mm. it's that yeah. inner voice that is our soul, you know, and, and by the way, you know, your listeners and, you know, ego shoots up and says, oh boy, now he's going to tell me I need to go, you know, join an ashram or move to <laughs> India or, you know, and, and what I want to tell you is not at all. I mean, getting in touch with that voice really only requires us to give it even the smallest space you know, to allow yourself a few minutes every day where you just pull yourself out of the heads down, you know, emails or angry birds or, yeah. you know, bottle of wine or, you know, sports event with the buddies. Give yourself a few minutes each day. And for each of us, it's going to be different. For some, it, for me, it's nature. For some, it might be a place of worship. It could be um, a quiet place in their home where you just allow that centered place. And I know each of us right now actually completely understands what I'm talking about. That place inside of each, each of us, that is the real you, you know, um, the part of you that isn't your thoughts, but actually can observe your thoughts. If you think about this, what's the part of you right now that can stop and look at your thoughts? You know, you are not your thoughts. You're the witnessing awareness that has the ability to observe that place, that centered place is the place you need to get to know a little bit more. And it just requires giving even the smallest amount of space. Beautifully put. <laughs> Beautifully put. Okay, so David, one more question for you because I'm I'm so intrigued by this in the book, the uh, the integration, if you will, of left and right 
brain qualities, right? Such as the, the artist and the analyst and the purpose and the practical and the intuition and the intellect. Tell us about that because that's from personal experience as well. It is. Thanks. You know, let me illustrate it with a real example. So, you know, as I mentioned, I grew up in this sort of conservative Midwest town, culturally Jewish, go become an executive or a lawyer or a doctor. And I found myself in the, the reader of Heed Your Call, I think, hopefully will enjoy the story, um, you know, moving out to Oregon against kind of all logic and odds and meeting this amazing woman who would become my wife, Heather. And, you know, Heather was this hippie, West Coast, you know, long blonde hair um, lady who was really all about living in the moment, all about creativity, all about meaning, purpose, living from a place of wonder, and probably didn't have a single bone in her body around kind of the traditional left brain, you know, set your alarm clock, uh, balance your checkbook, and have a grocery shopping list. Right. And, you know, you can kind of see how we might have been, you know, attracted to coming together. And ultimately where that led was in her having this really amazing idea around starting this company that became Oregon Chai. And, you know, I would not have been able to birth that idea because I was more of a traditional left brain, by the numbers, buckle down, logical, analytical guy. And here is this sort of really creative woman who says, you know, I want to start a company making chai. Look what Starbucks is doing with coffee. And if you're a tea drinker, you're still relegated to sort of like a mug of hot water and a bag of Earl right. Grey or chamomile. <laughs> you know, what's the fun in that? So I want to make something fun. And, and so, you know, we had traveled together in Southeast Asia and it had, to, uh, you know, traditional chai. And she said, I know exactly what to make. I know what it's going to taste like. I know what I'm going to call it. I know how the consumer is going to react to it. But you know what? I don't want to have to think about anything else other than that stuff. Oh, I okay. said, great, I'll do all the other stuff, the operations, the legal, the logistics, the finance. And so this getting back to your question about this left brain, right brain, what we sort of stumbled into was that together, this merger of left and right, not left or right, created this really magical company that grew from our kitchen to a business of almost 40 million in revenue. And as we then started to look at other companies and businesses and individuals, we started to have this barometer of being able to gauge, is this a person who lives their life in an integrated way where they can toggle seamlessly back and forth between, you know, results on the left brain and values on the right brain, you know, finance on the left brain and brand on the right brain, mm -hmm. you know? And we started to see that the magic, you know, what, what the world would really, really sort of applaud was when an individual or company could seamlessly embrace both. Again, power of and. Mm -hmm. So in all of the work we've done with our investments and the companies that we accelerate and advise, we have really purposefully built this model around what we call intuitive analytics. You have to have, you can't leave that creative energy uh, on, you know, on the side of the road. And you also can't leave the need to actually, you know, balance the books on the side of the road. It's when you do both that it really gets cool. And, you know, an example is Apple computer, you know, the most valuable company in the history of business. And I would argue it's because on any given day, you know, I would challenge anyone to tell me, are they a consumer brand or are they a technology company? The answer is they're both. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, the stuff works. It's got great technology, and it's also beautiful and design-oriented and fun and, and you know, evocative, like a brand. Where, say, Intel is a company with a fraction of the value of Apple, and I would argue that's because you know, they're very much a left-brain kind of engineer-run organization and doesn't really have the consumer brand side of it in place. So you know, there's real-world examples of this for us to look at. Absolutely. Good illustration. David, what a joy to speak with you. I'm, I'm so excited for you. The book is fantastic. I will highly recommend it to all our, our, our listeners. Excuse me. And I want to remind everybody of the title, Heed Your Call, Integrating Myth, Science, Spirituality, and Business by David Howitt. David, tell us how we can buy the book and how we can follow you in the social media world. Awesome. Thanks, Carolyn. So, um, you can buy the book at any local bookstore or certainly at Amazon by, ser by searching Heed Your Call or my name, David Howitt, H-O-W-I-T-T. -T. 
And our business, the Merriweather Group, which is really set up to support um, disruptive, growing consumer brands, um, we are at www.merriweathergroup.com. And that's M E R I W E T H E R G R O U P.com. And on Facebook and Twitter, there is Merriweather Group and Heed Your Call. And we do a lot of really great updates daily with content and interesting, hopefully thought-provoking thought. And I would love to hear from your listeners. I would love feedback on the book, on the interview, um, questions, whatnot. Um, I'll try to be as accessible as I can. And I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you, Carolyn, and your, and your entire listening audience. And um, hope that the book can be helpful to folks in navigating an abundant and purpose-driven life. I love it. David, thank you so much. What a joy. I know the book has been really meaningful to me, and I am eagerly sharing it with friends and colleagues. So I wish you great success. Thanks so much, Carolyn. Be well. And thank you for tuning into your working life, where my goal is to help you design your career and life destiny so it doesn't happen by default. True life satisfaction is possible, and it's time to embrace what you love doing so you can do more of it. I'm Caroline Dowd-Higgins. Take good care. (laughs) 